sessions. This is uh, something we've evolved over the years. Uh, and back in uh, Hims 09, we had a session called Meet the Bloggers, where uh, different uh, audiences could get to hear from bloggers themselves, how they do it, why they do it, and why it's relevant. Uh, this year, we've evolved it to the point where we actually have a provider's edition uh, of this session. And so, uh, without much further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our moderator and uh, our panel. Uh, we've got uh, today moderating uh, Rich Alamore, and we've got John Sharp as one of our bloggers, uh, David Kibbe, and John Marzano. So uh, we'll just get started here, and just a quick note about hashtags. Uh, as you can see up here, we've got the HIMS 11 stream. Uh, any tweets particular to the session, please mark your tweets with HIMS 11, and then also add SMC for Social Media Center. This way. Uh, you can follow that stream, and anyone that's uh, beyond this room can also do so. So, uh, let's welcome uh, Rich Elmore. Thank you. So, thanks a lot. Um, Cesar, just note so you know, we're going to be... So, we're going to be using the HCSM, Healthcare Social Media, tag for tweets for questions. So, if you have any questions you want to ask the panelists, you can get them to us through that, HCSM. Uh, certainly appreciate it. So we've got a great panel today. Really, uh, the last couple of years I've attended the social media uh, uh, meetings. And for those of you who have also done that, in, in Atlanta, I think it was last year, it was in like a little glass house. It was like really teeny tiny and there was very little room and it got very, very hot. And uh, it, there were great sessions, great panels. And obviously it's expanded a lot. Hims is recognizing the value of uh, social media to our uh, healthcare providers. And this is a great opportunity to get that perspective. So what we're really trying to focus in on here today is provider use of social media. We've got some great panelists. We've got David Kibbe, who is a well-known, long-time blogger for a number of blogs, including the, the healthcare blog at Kaiser Health News. Uh, John, and he's also the uh, senior advisor to the American Academy of Family Physicians. We've got John Marzano, who's the vice president and chief communications officer for our hometown host of this conference, Orlando Health. And uh, John has uh, just a tremendous presence on both uh, Facebook and YouTube, established for the Orlando Healthcare Organization. For those of you who haven't seen that, definitely worth taking a look uh, uh, after the session. And then lastly, John Sharp, who is with the uh, Cleveland Clinic, is a manager of research informatics. And John is also uh, a longtime blogger, uh, social media expert. Uh, he's going to be presenting at a couple of other sessions uh, later this week, and uh, you should definitely check those out as well. I think. Thank you all for being here. So uh, with that in mind, let's start with uh, some of the questions that I've got pre-prepared, and then as uh, you get creative with your questions, we'll certainly get those up to the panelists as well. So I think what we'll start with is just trying to understand what you, what's your organization's story around social media. Well, I'm going to talk about what's the particular story social media. Uh, the American Academy of Family Physicians has about 65,000 physicians in we have a uh, sound. Sound for David. Yeah. Sound. We have sound. Okay, great. Oh, I've been eating it. Okay. Um, the, the story is uh, that the American Academy of Fine Physicians has about 65,000 active members. And in 2003, when I started working with the American Academy of Fine Physicians full time, and now part time, um, we had only 10% of our members using electronic health records. Um, and it was my job to um, see if we could improve that. We now are at 60% of our members using electronic health records from a commercial vendor. 
Um, and um, that's something of an anomaly within physician membership groups, but uh, we actually have the data to prove it. Um, one of the things that we did, which was really, really important in raising that number, was to make it possible for any family physician anywhere in the country to find another family physician like him or her who had had success using electronic health records. And <clears throat> this was before Twitter, and it was actually before Facebook, really. Um, so we used social media that was arch archaic by today's uh, standards. We used primarily uh, a, a listserv and um, good old meetings and phone and, and other kinds of communications with our doctors. But the listserv was really our key story because it went from about 38 doctors to over 1,200 physicians in a little over one year. And it created thousands and thousands of conversations occurring um, every month around electronic health records and around how to, how to do it, how to do this successfully. So uh, that's really the story uh, that, that, that I would like to leave. Um, I, I think we are, as an academy right now, going into more uh, active uh, social media of the Facebook kind, but um, I'm not really involved in that. Thanks. And for the panelists, I got some feedback that if you can uh, chew right into that microphone, that'll help. Thanks. All right. Good. All right. Well, at, the, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, we kind of uh, waded into the water of social media over a period of time. Uh, initially, it was mostly uh, independent efforts by people who were interested in blogging and other social media. Uh, a physician here, a nurse there, and my, you know, a few people in IT doing kind of unofficial things. Um, then uh, what came about is our chief marketing officer really saw the, that this is going to take off. And uh, in February 2009, uh, he developed a strategy with his team uh, with both uh, public communications, or now called corporate communications, and marketing people, and then brought in people who are already active in social media like myself, both to develop a uh, social media committee or work group and uh, social media policy, and then uh, also at the same time approaching, uh, really doing a top-down uh, initial up to that point, it was pretty much bottom up in terms of interest in social media. But he went to uh, the, our board of governors, presented a strategy, said we're going to launch this. This will help us. Uh, also, because we're a health organ organization that's trying to have a national, international presence, that, that would help that those national goals as well. And uh, got the approval of the board. Got them on. Uh, convinced that this was worth doing, we could put in the safety controls to make it work, and uh, launched it, and it kind of gradually grew from there, and now we're very built out Facebook presence, Twitter, we're using Twitter for uh, physician chats to ask questions and interact that way, as well as a big emphasis on uh, wellness, which is uh, kind of core to our organization as well, our CEO is very much into wellness, both for employees and, and patients in Northeast Ohio and everywhere, really. So a lot of wellness messages through social media um, uh, and even some mobile apps now. But I can talk about that later. Thanks, Jim. Well, I think I'm going to provide you uh, perspective from the marketing and communication side, which is, which is my function at Orlando Health. And it's interesting, I think, what was one of the main triggers for us was the local economy. You know, Florida was hit probably harder than a lot of areas of the country. Uh, when the downturn hit in late 08, early 09, that our local news media was disappearing. Um, reporters were getting laid off. Uh, there really wasn't a good resource out there to be able to pitch stories to. So we took a look at that as what are some other tactical options we can use to get our story out to tell our story? Uh, and the, the way we did that is, is began to look at both uh, Facebook and YouTube as options for us because of the use of video. Uh, our news media team then became news producers instead of news pitchers. And so they began to develop 
uh, the stories within the organization, creating the stories the way we want them to be created, positioning them or spinning them, if you will, uh, in the way we wanted them without the controversy and the worry of having to always justify or to hit that controversial issue that the news media was looking for. So I think that was one of the main triggers why we started taking a look at this. And fortunately, I was blessed with having two 20-somethings on our team. And uh, they came in and started telling the story about there are people out there talking about us and we're not participating. And we said, well, we have to fix that. Uh, so we don't look at this right now as, as the be-all and the end-all. Again, it's just another tactic that we utilize as part of telling the story. Now, we're blessed at Orlando Health with having some good brands within a brand. We have the, the Arnold and Winnie Palmer Hospitals that are part of our system. We have an MD Anderson facility that's part of our system. So to be able to effectively tell that story and incorporate those brands within the Orlando Health brand has been very advantageous for us. Uh, we launched in November of 2009 with both of those, and I think as of today, we're just short of 9,000 uh, fans on Facebook, and we probably have over 59,000 hits on our YouTube site. You know, we're by no means the biggest and the largest. We're a player in this environment, and I think here in Central Florida, it was something we used and took advantage of because we we had an opportunity to do something a little bit different than traditional ways of getting the story out. Well, thank you very much. I mean, we've already gotten some questions up on Twitter, so we'll introduce one of those right now. As you look at it from a provider perspective, are you seeing much patient response? Is a patient part of the uh, audience that you're attempting to serve or providers should be attempting to serve? Okay. Okay. All right, well, we've seen um, some interaction, well, as I said, on Twitter when we do these physician chats, there's a lot of... Uh, there are some questions coming through on Twitter. Those are scheduled chats and announced via Twitter and Facebook and other things. The um, On Facebook, we had, uh, initially, we had it locked down, so it was just a, a fan page, and you, could, you couldn't post anything, only uh, the marketing people could post something. The We decided to open that up, and with some really good effects, and now even are asking uh, patients to contribute their stories on Facebook. Obviously, they're very short posts, but at least um, things about um, ways the hospital has been helpful to them or a family member. And we have stories coming through of you know kidney transplants who had their lives transformed and other kinds of things. So uh, we're beginning to see more of that. Uh, as we open up the communication channel with very few negatives, really, in that process. So it's been a real advantage, I think. I think from the start, we've seen uh, patient interaction with us in a variety of ways. Uh, patients will um, ask for information that we can help provide for them. They will go on there, and it's amazing to me and others how much they go on and, and mention their physicians mention specific services that they've experienced and really taking the opportunity to thank physicians and staff uh, in our organization. We've seen a lot of that. Uh, we try to, you know, push out information through physician expert videos on a variety of subjects, uh, clinically and otherwise. I think that's been a big hit. However, the biggest, the biggest hit we get on our YouTube site are just prospective patients or patients who are looking to take tours of our facilities. Uh, we put our, our uh, presidents of all of our hospitals walking through the facilities, doing a tour and actually showing the place. And I'll tell you, that the, the facilities look tremendous on a YouTube video, and you can really tell the story in about three to four minutes. We find that those are probably the most viewed videos, uh, anyone looking to utilize our organization is going on there first to try to find out about the services. So I think we've seen it in a variety of ways. Um, it's not all been positive, and we can get into that certainly if you want, but uh, I think for the most part it's been very well received. And again, it's another way to communicate, another way to interact with patients and individuals out there who want to talk to you and want to learn about your services. 
Uh, just very quickly, from the point of view of the American Academy of Family Physicians, about 25% of our members now use web portals in their practices. <clears throat> and I think that uh, that's going to grow very significantly with uh, both stage one and stage two, particularly stage two meaning for use for the next couple of years. Thanks. And we just got another question and kind of a follow-up, uh, John Sharp, to the question, the comment you made earlier that uh, you felt that they had the, you had the proper safety controls in place for healthcare social media. What are, what are some of those? Okay. Good question. Uh, well, one is a good um, employee social media policy, for one, um, which, well, in so many words, say, says, you know, be a grown-up, don't do stupid things. Uh, and there are a limited number of people who can really, uh, who have really control of the corporate accounts uh, on all the social media channels. Uh, and they have a very, you know, they're your marketing people and corporate communications people who know the party line, stick to the party line. Now, uh, you know, if employees violate the policy by we haven't had any worst case scenarios as we discussed earlier by Christina about uh, you know, people posting photos or anything, but we have had some misuse and some employees have been disciplined for those things. On the patient side, we do have a social media policy. If you post on our social media, you know, there's so many, uh, uh, well, you can read it on our website. It's at the footer of our homepage, clevelandclinic.org. But, um, I guess the, the main other control is uh, listening, as like you were talking about. People are talking about you on Twitter or trying to interact with you on these different social media sites. Are you responding or are you ignoring them? I think if you respond, even if it's something negative, and uh, I'll give you an example, an honest example, and you can look on Twitter and see this yourself if you uh, searched on uh, Cleveland Clinic or uh, the term Cleveland Clinic, every once in a while someone will complain about our billing office, something we continuously try to improve on, but there's always somebody who gets, you know, uh, the 20 minute wait to, or gets shifted around the billing office and it's a real problem. We hope that's rare, but it, it's out there now as a public thing that people are talking about this. Or there you put on hold for 20 minutes for appointments, whereas our standard is to answer calls by the third ring, you know, and that doesn't always happen. So there's strategies in place to try to fix that stuff, but it's happening. So it's mostly listening to people responding when we see negative comments. Thanks, John. I'm personally shocked to hear that anyone gets any issues with their billing offices, but uh, we'll... Uh... <laughs> We'll kind of go beyond, move right beyond that. So, uh, no what, food complaints. <laughs> so, so, what role will participatory health play in uh, social media? That's a big, yeah, that, that's a huge question. Um, as one of the co founders, I guess, of the participatory medicine movement, I, I, think, I think the goal is enormous and important. Um, because participatory medicine is more than uh, any particular kind of social media, at least to me. Uh, it's about real uh, exchange between providers and, and patients and patient and family um, in, in, a, in a way that is uh, consistent and meaningful and um, uh, bespeaks as partnership uh, and, a, and a relationship. And I, and I think that that's um, something that can be uh, enabled by health information technology. But I think one of the things we're finding is, is the health information technology and the social media technology in and of itself is not sufficient to make it happen. I, I think what's missing, you mentioned earlier, Dan, about the uh, patient portals, electronic medical records, electronic health records, and personal health records. Uh, there, we're not really at the point yet where that's converging with social media. I think that's going to happen in the next couple of years, and that will further enable uh, participatory medicine, because I can envision a, a time where through your patient portal or personal health record, you can actually be connected with other people 
with the same uh, disease or condition if you want to. Again, it has to be permission-based. Uh, or see a Twitter stream on that particular condition. What, you know, particularly there's a lot of activity in social media and diabetes. Is there an opportunity to connect? Oh, one other quick point on that that's actually happening in small pieces today at our institute, particularly at our Heart and Vascular Institute, there were two there are two patient communities, and these are around more rare diseases. I think one is Marfan syndrome, and I forget what the other one is. Um, that are either organized about one was organized I think around a Google group and another around a blog just so where a lot of people are interacting about a certain disease and a certain surgeon who saved a lot of lives at our institution. And um, our patient education people who were very active in that, uh, in social media, connected with those communities and actually organized a meetup at the hospital for the people in that social media community uh, for those specific diseases and got to meet the doctor and so on. So I think that's kind of a step toward you know, we talk a lot about meetups among ourselves, but patient meetups around a specific condition, I think, is a real opportunity uh, in the future, and we'll see where we can take that. Yeah, I think, uh, as John said, I think we're just scratching the surface um, with participatory uh, medicine or, or consumer-directed uh, medicine. Patients or people generally fear coming to the hospital. It's not a great place all the time. To go, so I think we can talk to them. We can engage them in their comfort zone, which is their home or, or wherever that may be. I think that's going to be uh, it's going to create much more of a, a synergistic relationship with that patient or future patient versus you know okay, it's time to go see your doctor. It's time you, know, you have to go in the hospital for a procedure. Not very pleasant. So this is a way to sort of bridge that I think a little bit uh, before that before that experience or utilization occurs. Thanks, guys. So, so what are some of the legal and ethical considerations? I mean, what, what, what do you do with negative comments? Um, <laughs> well, I, let's see, where do I start? Um, we've, had, we've had our share, and I'll tell you one example. When we first launched, we had a former employee who tried to sabotage that whole effort. Um, he had left the organization. He was disgruntled about some uh, benefit coverage availability that our organization provided. And he took his argument to our Facebook site right from the get-go. Um, so early on, we had a challenge that really sort of got our feet wet in this whole process. And of course, every day I'm wondering, you know, are the executives going to come in and say, what have you done to us? because uh, this guy was making our lives uh, pretty miserable for a while. And, you know, we allowed him uh, the opportunity to...